This is Dr. Mubeen Sayed. Welcome to another episode of Long Story Short with Dr. Bean from the FLCCC platform. So today's discussion is beautiful. It is about an anti-diabetic, anti-lipid, liver healing and quite a versatile drug, herbal medicine, Chinese herbal medicine called berberine. So let's look into this together. I think you'll enjoy it. So the studies that I'm going to use to have the discussion today, this is one of them. Berberine improves glucose metabolism in diabetic rats by inhibition of hepatic gluconeogenesis, production of new glucose by liver. Then this is another study. This is glucose lowering effect of berberine on type 2 diabetes, a systemic review and meta-analysis. In here, there is a specific part of the study that I want to discuss and that is the effect on the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin and effect of berberine on those cells in increasing the production of insulin. And then thirdly, berberine lowers blood glucose in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients through increasing insulin receptor expression. So these are the three studies. This study, this is the most involved study. So I'm going to go through these two quickly and then we'll look into this one a little more thoroughly. So let's start. And I see that my picture is overlapping a part of the picture here. So I'm going to remove my picture for a second so you can see that it is written glycolysis. So let's start with this study. I am going to this diagram. I'm going to start from here and then we'll dig deeper into this. So first of all, if I go here, this is a cell membrane. So imagine this is all internal of a cell. This is an insulin receptor on it here. So insulin receptor in these studies will be INSR, insulin receptor. Here this little rounded thing is the insulin itself. Now generally what happens is that when insulin binds with an insulin receptor on a cell's surface, the receptor is on the cell surface, then inside the cell some enzymes start working. This is called a second messenger system. First messenger being the hormone itself or the substance or the message. And then the second messenger is the response within the cell. So here if you see when the insulin receptor becomes activated, it causes insulin receptor substrate, another set of enzymes present, they become activated. And again, I'm going to keep it very simple. This is actually quite a long and complex structure that I want to stay a little high level on. When the insulin receptor substrate is activated, that activates PI3K, which in turn, so PI3K is another enzyme that is attached to the cell membrane internal site. Once this becomes activated, it activates another enzyme called AKT. This is the central hub of the response. AKT in turn does the following things. Number one, it causes the glucose receptors, which are usually, so imagine that a cell is a room and inside the room, there is a bag and that bag is full of glucose receptors. So we call it in the technical terms, we say the glucose receptors are sequestered in a vesicle. That bag is called a vesicle and the glucose receptors are in it. So when AKT becomes activated, it causes this GLUT4 or these glucose receptors to be brought to the cell surface and become attached there. When the glucose receptors are attached here, these cause, in turn, glucose to be brought into the cell. And as you know that one of the functions of insulin is to trigger the uptake of glucose. And that uptake is triggered by increasing the glucose receptors on the cell surface. So that's one action. Then the other action is here, if you look at this part, AKT blocks FOX01 or FOX head fork head box 01 enzyme or simply called FOX01. FOX01 when active it goes to the nucleus of the cell which in this diagram this is the nucleus. So the FOX01 enzyme goes into the nucleus. Inside the nucleus it causes certain genes and their transcription or expression of them. These genes I have written two of them over here. One is PEPCK and the other one is G6PAs or glucose 6-phosphatase and phosphophenol carboxykinase. Phosphoenol carboxykinase, PEPCK. Now, these two enzymes, 
are rate limiting enzymes of gluconeogenesis that means production of new glucose what happens is when we are fasting we have less glucose that we have taken from outside then there is less insulin and when there is less insulin then fox01 is not stopped by the insulin messengers and the result is it causes the enzymes that take part in making new glucose within our body to be increased so this would happen in a liver for example when we are in a fasting state liver will make glucose now think about it insulin is released in our body when there is more glucose when you take food and carbohydrates or sugars insulin level increases and now you can probably agree with me that when the insulin levels are high that means there is glucose that has been brought in from outside do we need to make new glucose inside no so the presence of insulin causes gluconeogenesis to be stopped but reduction in insulin causes gluconeogenesis to increase in diabetics the presence or absence of insulin doesn't really have much control over the gluconeogenesis and gluconeogenesis just keeps happening and as we keep making more glucose from our own body we stay in a hyperglycemic state now another mechanism for insulin again going back to normal is that when akt becomes active it will suppress or inhibit another enzyme called tsc1 and tsc2 or enzymes these enzymes in turn suppress another enzyme called mTOR C1 actually mTOR C1 and 2 but here mTOR C1 is fine for our discussion mTOR C1 when active it causes another enzyme called SREB P1C to become activated this enzyme is very important should keep in mind it causes FAS which is fatty acid synthase enzyme to be activated and lipid generation occurs lipogenesis occurs so this is the mechanism by which on one end insulin is bringing glucose in on the other end insulin is causing more fats to be created from these nutrients that are coming in so again this is a function of insulin to say i am produced in response of the person who has eaten food i'm sure there are nutrients i'm going to go and ask the cells to store those nutrients as fats so insulin what it does is it blocks tsc1 which in turn blocks mtor c1 but if you block tsc1 then mtor c1 is not blocked anymore and then this pathway starts working and lipogenesis occurs that's a normal behavior of insulin to give rise to making more lipids and fats of course in diabetics this mechanism goes bad as well and we just keep making more and more fats which then causes fatty liver which also causes the liver cells to not function correctly because they are just there is accumulation of fats in them which in turn causes all of these mechanisms to not fire correctly and we start developing insulin resistance so these are the normal now i want to go to the insulin production insulin receptors and berberine and then i'll come back to this diagram to discuss how the berberine works on insulin so first mechanism this one is very simple when berberine is given administered within a week it starts showing its results and what it does is it causes production of messenger rna that means berberine affects the nucleus of our cells and it causes the expression of insulin receptor making genes so it would cause the expression of those genes in the nucleus that are responsible to make insulin receptors so those giving administering berberine causes insulin receptor mrna to be produced which would in turn cause the insulin receptors to be produced which would in turn cause more receptors to be present on the cell surface which would cause more response to insulin which would cause glucose to be taken up which would reduce hyperglycemia and improve insulin resistance by providing more receptors for insulin so that is this study berberine lowers blood glucose in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients through increasing insulin receptor expression our previous work demonstrated that berberine increases insulin receptor expression and improves glucose utility both in vitro that is in the lab and in animal models 
Here we study the insulin receptor upregulation and glucose lowering activities of berberine in humans. So I would leave the study here and have this takeaway that one action of berberine is to increase insulin receptors. Now I'm going to go to this part here. This is inside the pancreas. So pancreas is made up of many kinds of cells. We are interested in beta cells, pancreatic beta cells. The pancreatic beta cells are really tiny glucometers. What happens is when we eat food and there is glucose, so let's say high glucose levels, then glucose would simply drop in. I believe these are GLUT2 type of glucose receptors through which glucose just uninhibitedly comes into the cell. These receptors are not insulin dependent. So they really, these receptors allow the beta cells to just measure blood glucose levels. When the glucose arrives in the cell, of course, glucose's function is to help produce energy. So more ATP is produced, which is the energy. When ATP is produced, there are channels that are called potassium ATP channels or K-ATPs. These channels, in the presence of ATP, they close down. Now, what does this mean? Potassium is a positive ion. These cells, for example, beta cells, are neurons, are muscles, and many other cells, they work in a very interesting way. They have an electrical charge on them, on their membrane. Usually that charge is negative. That means inside is less positive compared to outside. So they are negative. This is called resting membrane potential. Then what happens is, when the cell is going to function, we say that this cell becomes depolarized. What that means is that it has this polarity that inside is negative and outside is positive. Then you bring in a lot of positive ions inside, usually sodiums, and that depolarizes it. That makes inside and outside neutral. And so the cell doesn't have any polarity. When that happens, various other channels start working and we say that cell has become functional. Then what the cell does is it needs to stop working. This is like you turn on a motor and then at some point you're going to turn the motor off. So what happens is you push the positive ions back outside and the cell becomes negative again. We call it it has become repolarized and the cell stops working. And the cell just continues to go through these pulses of function. So the takeaway here is that if you push potassium out, which is a positive ion, then you would cause the cell to become more negative inside relatively and the cell will not function. But if you keep potassium inside, then the cell would continue to become positive and positive and it will become depolarized. That is, inside negativity will reduce until it becomes zero and the cell would start functioning. So how does that happen? When we get the glucose, glucose makes ATP. ATP causes these potassium channels to become closed. That causes potassium, the positive ion, to be trapped inside, which causes more and more positivity to develop. Eventually, when the cell depolarizes, then the voltage-gated calcium channels open. So these are channels that are sitting in the membrane as well, but they would only work at a neutral voltage. So once a cell becomes depolarized, these channels open up, calcium comes in. Calcium usually comes in to have a neuron or a muscle or beta cells here to perform their function. And here the calcium would cause insulin to be released. It is actually very interesting that if you think about it microscopically, these little vesicles of insulin, and actually for any other hormone secreting cell, it's a similar behavior. These little vesicles, little bags, have the hormone in them and then when the calcium comes in it causes various proteins to become activated that would drag this vesicle near the membrane surface and open it on the surface so that whatever is inside the vesicle can be spilled out the cell and that is a secretion so in this case insulin is released takeaway high glucose level will cause cell to depolarize and start releasing insulin on the other hand when the glucose levels are low then what happens is there is less glucose that is going in the cell. That means less ATP is being produced. That means these potassium channels cannot stay closed. They open up. When they open up, potassium starts leaking outwards. When it goes outwards, that causes the membrane to become hyperpolarized or become more and more negative. And this cell would not work. When the cell becomes very negative inside, it just says, you know what? 
I am just too negative. I'm feeling really bad. I'm not going to do anything. So the cell becomes negative inside. We call it hyperpolarized, even more than the normal negativity. And it will not do anything. The calcium channels will not work. Calcium will not come in. Insulin will not be released. And this is what we want when the glucose levels are low. Good. Now I'm going to introduce berberin to this and one more potassium channel. So if you see here, I have added one more channel here. This channel is called KCNH6. It's another potassium channel. That is why the name K. This channel usually stays open and causes the potassium to leak out. So that means there are this channel that lets the potassium go out, but it is energy dependent. Then this channel lets the potassium go out by itself. There are actually many, many types of potassium voltage gated channels on the beta cells. We're just talking about two here. Now, think about it for a second. There is high glucose and we know that if there is high glucose levels, then the potassium is not allowed to go out so that the cell can release insulin. If you give berberin, what that does is it also blocks this channel as well for potassium. Normally what happens is this channel also lets the potassium go out and it is present in normal cell and some potassium is going out from here, other is not going out. Eventually there is more potassium getting accumulated here. But if you block this as well, then the potassium accumulation will become more and that will cause depolarization. When the depolarization would occur, the insulin would start releasing. Now these potassium channels, the KCNH6, their job is to let potassium quickly run out so that the cell can become negative again and then it can become functional again. So it can go to rest and start again. This is a very interesting part of our biology is every biology thing that is around us. Everything takes rest and then does a pulse of action. Takes rest, does a pulse of action. If you see, we sleep, we work. Then we sleep, we work. If you look at our heart, it relaxes and contracts, relaxes and contracts. Similarly, our functional cells, they will become rested. Then they'll have another burst of activity. Then they'll become rested and so on. So once a cell has worked and it has depolarized, we want the potassium or positivity to get out. And this channel is used for that. However, berberin can actually block this channel. The result is potassium cannot get out very easily. That would mean the cell would stay depolarized for a long time because this one is already not working and this one is now blocked by berberin. When the cell would stay polarized for a longer time, it would keep releasing insulin for a longer time. And this is how berberin in a high glucose environment causes the pancreatic cells to release insulin for longer time. Of course, very useful for diabetics. At the same time, it doesn't cause hypoglycemia because it doesn't cause abnormally produced insulin. It only produces insulin when the cell is in high metabolic state because that is when blocking this channel would help keep the cell depolarized. Remember when there is not much glucose, then the cell is not even depolarized. When it is not depolarized, when it is not functioning, then blocking this channel would do nothing. But if it is functioning, then blocking this channel would allow the cell to function a little longer. So if I go to the low glucose levels, and this is a very important point, why is this important? The statement then becomes, or observation becomes, that berberine releases insulin when glucose is present. If glucose is less and you administer berberine, it would not create more insulin release and not cause hypoglycemia. So it's a safe drug in that way. So here, this is also a pancreatic cell. This is a low glucose environment. And you know that when this is a low glucose environment, then this potassium channel is already open and it is throwing potassium out. The cell is not really working because inside is negative because positives are going out. Now, if you positives are going out from here as well. But if you block this, then it doesn't really matter because the cell was not depolarized. There was potassium already going out cell was actually in a hyperpolarized state, it was not really functioning. So if it was not functioning, you do not need the potassiums to go out because there are no potassium or less potassium anyways inside. The cell is already negative. So in the lower glucose environment, berberin does not cause more insulin production. But if the glucose is higher, then if you administer berberin, then it would cause more insulin production help reduce 
the hyperglycemia plus in diabetic patients they need more insulin they need more insulin receptors they need more insulin sensitivity and all of those mechanisms can actually be offered by berberine so this is the second discussion and this part of the discussion was this paper so if you see here in china a classic chinese herbal formula that includes berberine is a good remedy for diabetes berberine is an isoquinoline alkaloid that is extracted from traditional chinese medicines such as cortex phalodendry or huangbai and rhizoma coptidis huanglian studies have shown that berberine has hyperglycemia dependent meaning there has to be more glucose dependent glucose lowering effect because berberine as an insulinotropic that means causes insulin to be released agent directly binds to kcnh6 potassium channel and reduces so we have seen the rest over there so this is this paper and now finally the really important remaining pieces this one is the third paper this one this is the berberine improves glucose metabolism in diabetic rats by inhibition of hepatic gluconeogenesis so new glucose production inhibition so let's see how does this work so imagine when the berberine is given this is the study they did this on rats when the berberine is given focus here for a second this is a mitochondria we know that inside the mitochondria there is an electron transport chain which whose job is to make atp it takes the nutrients and the substrates from the nutrients and oxygen and eventually makes atp and carbon dioxide so that is happening inside the mitochondria berberine affects the mitochondrial complex one of the electron transport chain so just simply it reduces the oxygen consumption and it reduces the atp production of the mitochondria so that is here we start our story here when the mitochondrial oxygen and atp is reduced then automatically when the energy levels go down the cell decides that you know what i need to break down more glucose to produce energy so glycolysis or glycolysis that is glucose breakdown glycolysis starts and the glucose starts breaking down which is very good because number 1 will use this glucose and break it down instead of converting that into fats or glycogen and secondly when the glucose will be broken down inside the cell then from outside more glucose would tend to come in against a concentration gradient so that's a good thing so this is one action that would happen second because there is less energy less atp inside the nucleus the expression of genes which will allow more things to work in the cell will reduce why because imagine that there is no power in the house and we are using candle lights or flashlights will you like to just leave the flashlight on for a long time no you are going to conserve energy similarly when the atp levels are lower the nucleus tries to reduce the functions of the cell only to the most important functions in that process it reduces according to this study what it does is it reduces messenger rna production of these two enzymes and let me connect them for you so when the messenger rna is produced less that would cause less protein synthesis that would produce one of the set of proteins that are less are pepsi can g6 pas remember that these were related to gluconeogenesis that is production of new glucose so when we give berberine independent of the insulin pathway there were previous studies why do i say independent of the pathway and this study stresses that there were previous studies that were postulating that probably berberine works by just increasing the insulin or by increasing the insulin receptors this study found that that's not entirely the case berberine can actually reduce these enzymes independent of the presence or absence of insulin and how did they find that they found that at the fasting time in the rats when the insulin levels were low even then giving berberine caused this gluconeogenesis to be blocked normally what would happen when at the fasting time our glucose levels are low our insulin levels are low we would start making gluconeogenesis will start making new glucose but this found out that when you give berberine it will not let new glucose be produced independent of how insulin is doing so that is excellent gluconeogenesis will reduce that means hyperglycemia would reduce that means fasting glucose levels would drop which is a normal behavior so that is one then if you see here 
we have already talked about the mitochondria. Then number three over here. This is a very important concept. I think this is the core. I was talking with Dr. Paul Merrick today. This is, I believe, the core, and I think he agrees with it. This is the core of berberine's benefit. And that is, berberine, just like it reduces these enzymes, through all that oxygen and ATP reduction and the less transcription of mRNA and then less production of proteins, it also causes less production of SREBP1C protein. This protein activates fatty acid synthase enzyme, which causes fatty acids to be formed. So berberine reduces the activity of this enzyme, which means the cells, for example, in the liver, they had actually observed the rat livers. The liver cells will not produce more fatty acids. They will not produce more lipids. So the fatty liver, I shouldn't say fatty liver, but the fats inside the liver or fat production inside the liver would start becoming reduced. That in the long run has a greatly positive effect of healing the liver. Dr. Paul Merrick was saying that type 1 diabetes is a disease of pancreas and type 2 diabetes seems to be a disease of the liver because of the fatty acids and all that. So here, when berberine starts helping the liver having low lipid production because it has blocked the lipid producing enzymes, then the liver has less hepatic steatosis, that is fats, less fatty acid synthesis, less fatty liver, that causes the liver cells, hepatocytes, to become better in their function because they're not jammed with the fatty acids, that insulin resistance. And the liver cells do not produce hyperglycemia because they're not malfunctioning. So the result, liver is healed or liver starts healing. It doesn't happen in one day, but liver starts healing. That is this mechanism. The gluconeogenesis reduces. That is this mechanism. And berberine directly interacts here. Here, berberine directly interacts here. Then glycolysis starts happening where berberine is directly working here. Then there is another very important thing. When there is less ATP, then another enzyme called AMPK. We have adenosine monophosphate, which becomes AM, adenosine diphosphate and then triphosphate. So AMP, ADP and ATP. This AMP is the molecule that is produced when there is less ATP. ATP is actually AMP plus two more phosphates. So when there are no two more phosphates, then we are left with AMP. There is an enzyme called AMP kinase or AMPK that becomes active when the ATP levels are low. And guess what it does? It tries to go get more glucose in the cell because it thinks, all right, the cell doesn't have energy. I need to go bring glucose in so we can make energy. So guess what it does? It goes to those GLUT4 channels and attaches them to the cell membrane, which causes glucose to start coming in. That reduces hyperglycemia, brings the glucose in. Then glucose go into glycolysis and gets broken down. So not only within the cell there is help, but outside the cell hyperglycemia is reducing as well, which is a very important thing because the diabetic damage occurs because of hyperglycemia. I mean, there are many other factors, but this is one of the important factors. So if I now summarize the effect of berberine, one, it produces more insulin in high metabolic state in high glucose state, not in low glucose state. So if I am in low glucose state and you give me berberine, it will not cause more insulin production and it will not cause hypoglycemia. So that's one. Second, it increases the insulin receptors, which means insulin resistance improves because there are now more receptors to respond to insulin. But we still need to fix the fatty acids and fats that are accumulating in the cells that are causing the resistance. And for that, as you saw, what it does is Berberine reduces lipid generation, fatty acid formation, and reduces the liver fats. Berberine reduces gluconeogenesis, so hyperglycemia by production of new glucose de novo that is within our body through the liver is reduced. Berberine causes the uptake of glucose that is already present in the circulation through having more GLUT4 channels expressed. And then berberine causes the production of more glycolysis and more AMPKs. So eventually reduces hyperglycemia, reduces production of new glucose, reduces fats, and improves insulin resistance. Beautiful product. We'll talk more over this Wednesday as well with Dr. Paul Marek. He has a beautiful presentation. We'll go over. 
but thank you very much for listening in and i'll talk to you later bye